You're listening to the OCD Stories podcast, hosted by me, Stuart Ralph. The OCD Stories is a podcast dedicated to raising awareness and understanding around obsessive compulsive symptoms. I do this through interviewing inspired therapists, psychologists, and people who have experienced OCD. Welcome to the OCD Stories. And welcome to episode 334 of the show. And in this one, I got back on Johnny Say. Johnny is a UK-based psychotherapist, and he was recently a co-therapist with me at the OCD camp. So it's great to get Johnny back on, and in particular, we discuss how he's doing, his own mental health, and how he practices self-compassion daily. We discuss shame in OCD, intrusive thoughts, and in doing compulsions. We discuss the inner critic, self-compassion, and how it can help. Building up psychological flexibility skills before exposure and response prevention therapy. Values-based exposures, dropping anchor, a compassionate approach to ERP, and much more. Um, I think this is an important episode. I hope you guys like it, and I hope it resonates with you and helps you in some way. And thank you to NoCD for supporting the podcast. NoCD offers affordable, effective, and convenient therapy available in the US and outside the US. To find out more about NoCD, their therapy plans, if they currently take your insurance, or to download their free app, head over to go.treatmyocd.com forward slash the OCD stories, or the link will be in the episode description. And thank you as always to you guys for listening. I deeply appreciate it. And without further ado, here is Johnny. Welcome back to the show, Johnny. Thanks, Stu. Great to be here again. Good yeah, to see you. Yeah, it's good to have you on again. Uh, I think it was 2019 was the last time you were a guest on the show. Um, obviously, you interviewed me a couple of months ago, uh, which I'll put the link in the show notes to that. But yeah, I think 2019 was when you were in the hot seat. So uh, it's good to have you back on. Uh, yeah. I first wanted to start with a different question that I don't really ask guests, which is just how are you? <laughs> I'm good. Yeah, I'm in the flow of a, a busy day of, of therapy and uh, some groups. I do some groups with Mind and NHS on a Friday. So act and cft groups so it's a pretty full-on day but a good day an enjoyable day how are you uh yeah same (laughs) same um so um okay you frame me off there uh (laughs) that was my aim all along (laughs) yeah i'm forgetting that so yeah so how are you in terms of like you know your own mental health and well-being and applying some of the skills that you teach to your own life how's all that going for you yeah, brilliant. Uh, I love, um, you know, talking about this aspect because, you know, in ACT and CFT, we share a lot of our own process, you know, in the service of therapy. So, uh, yeah, I'm very happy to talk about my own sort of approach to mental health. And yeah, as you said, I, I really use all the skills that I work with clients on. So, you know, accepting skills, self-compassion skills, work with my tricky brain, Um, You know, in terms of OCD, I I would say I don't struggle with OCD, you know, explicitly anymore because of developing, you know, diffusion, acceptance skills, being able to be with difficult thoughts and feelings, all this stuff. But I I certainly have my share of anxiety and and periods of, you know, more depressed mood that I I work with or, you know, I've got a long um, history of difficult mental health. And I would say the resonance of some of that is still around and I you know I just work with it I use self-compassion if I'm feeling low I'm very kind to myself and I I keep doing all the good things that that help me um if I have difficult stuff in in relationships or family stuff or dynamics I use all my skills there and I find it very helpful and then with clients in therapy you know I think if you're seeing a lot of clients in a week you need something to help you stay present stay engaged stay resourced i mean uh you know i find compassion is is like a battery pack really in a way for for this kind of work um so i i all day long i'm doing the practices with clients i'm using it as as i work on this stuff and i do all the exposures with them so i'm doing you know versions of that as i'm doing it with them and so i I practice a lot um you know in therapy yeah no thank you for sharing that's that's brilliant to hear um so um actually one one last quick question before we get into the meat of the podcast um i know you obviously trained as a kind of meditation mindfulness teacher before being a therapist is meditation something you practice like daily or have you is it 
change? Yeah, I, I have a daily practice. I, you know, I really do practice the skills that I do with clients. So, you know, every day I'll try to have one period of 10 to 20 minutes where I do something. Um, and often as a young father, as I'm sure you can, uh, or a father of a young child, I shouldn't call myself young on the day before my birthday, yeah. approaching a big number. Um, but, um, you know, as a father with a young child, there's not much time, is there? So, mm. you know, often it's last thing at night before I go to sleep or, yeah. um, you know, just between sessions or something like that. And I do, I practice, um, you know, skills like dropping anchor, urge surfing, mm. lots of compassion work. I mean, compassion is really my main daily practice. So I'll do sometimes, you know, CFT practices as you would read them in the book, sometimes, you know, just my own loving kindness practice or something like that. Um, but yeah, I do something daily. Sometimes it's shorter. Um, I don't really see it as a meditation practice like I might've done in the past where there are goals around uh, mm. progress and a sort of spiritual framework and things that I'm more seeing it as a way to practice skills to bring into my life and yeah. into my work and and things yeah okay good thank you thank you for sharing that uh so let's talk about self-compassion um specifically being an antidote to shame so how does shame um show itself in some of your clients of ocd yeah, I think shame is a huge theme. I mean, in mental health across the board, I mean, mm. almost all my clients um, across all presentations. But in OCD, I guess you can have, I mean, you know, shame is typ typically framed as that sense of I'm not good enough or I'm bad, mm. you know, compared with guilt where it's I've done bad things or, I, you know, I haven't done things well enough. Um, I like Russ Harris. He says that actually it's maybe more blurred than that. You know, you often have, a little bit of both really it's rare that you see one on its own but yeah. um you know that that sort of form of shame i think you can have it very much about the present moment experience of ocd so you can have shame of, around the compulsions that you know a lot of my clients are very logical analytical people and that part of their brain can see that the compulsion makes no sense so there's like a shame and embarrassment you know, sense of why am I doing this? You know, why can't I resist this? This makes no sense. But the feeling is so strong. So there's that, there's the shame around the, the nature of the intrusive thoughts, the sort of disturbing taboo, difficult thoughts that, that can be so painful with OCD. Um, and, and people can feel I'm a bad person because of that. There's something wrong with me, you know, that, that kind of shame. And then I guess there can be a shame history in, in CFT. We would look at the the sort of shame history and, and going back. And that can be so diverse in, in OCD. So it can include, you know, more standard types of, uh, you know, difficult early attachment experiences like emotional abuse, physical abuse, trauma, um, you know, but it, it can be more neglect or over control, you know, sometimes, uh, well, in, in CFT, Chris Irons, my supervisor, did some research with Paul Gilbert looking at like the the what can happen when you actually have parents that are over controlling of, of kids and how that can produce a sort of inner critic and a, a sense of shame because it doesn't enable that sense that, you know, I, I can trust myself and I can do this. Um, so you can have very kind parents who are just controlling because they're anxious and, and yeah. uh, you know, it's something I battle with myself trying to surf that urge and, you know, try to let, let my son go out in the world and do more. Um, and then then you can have the school experience, the, the sibling experience, you know, have, you know, bullying comes up over and over again with a lot of my clients. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, the, the kind of adverse childhood experiences really, as they're called the ACEs. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, certainly in my experience, they show up a lot, maybe not all the time, um, but there can be subtle versions of it. Um, of course, there can be lots of other things that, that relate to the history of OCD and, and are triggers and risk factors. But, you know, certainly that, so there can be shame around that childhood, mm -hmm. sibling, adolescent, um, you know, peer group experience right the way through. So I th I'd say shame in the present around OCD presentation and shame in the history. And I think doing compassion work on both of those can can be so helpful. Yeah, good, good, good points. And it, 
I like that you, you talked about much more than OCD there, because obviously there's a lot of things that make up a person. It's not just the OCD and these other factors may influence the OCD or no doubt influence the OCD. Um, you mentioned CFT a couple of times. It's just, I can't, I don't know if you said compassion focus therapy for anyone listening. That's what it stands for. But, um, sorry if you did actually say that. Maybe I didn't hear it. Yeah. Okay. That's really interesting. And, and, yeah, you said about the shame around the thoughts people get and like if they're logical, like I shouldn't get this. This is the amount of times I've heard my clients say, oh, it's silly. I know I shouldn't think this. And it's like, well, yeah, to your like intelligent part of your brain, the prefrontal cortex, the part that evolved last, it is silly. But the part that drives OCD doesn't know it's silly. It's terrified. It think it could well be a tiger in front of you. It can't distinguish between a real threat and a perceived threat. Um, and to that part of your brain, it's not silly. So it's trying to get them to get in touch with that and yeah. not, yeah, criticize themselves. Um, so um, on that then, how, how do you think shame kind of fuels OCD or makes it worse or harder to work with? Yeah, I think that shame, you know, if, if we experience a large amount of shame, it can add another voice into the mix. So you can have like the OCD intrusive part voice or, or image or feeling or urge. And then you can also have the shame, the inner critic. And the inner critic can, you know, be early on about the OCD experience. So, you know, why what's wrong with you? Why are you like this? You know, and it can get very harsh and critical. Obviously it can be contemptuous and, and very bullying. Um, later on, it can get into therapy of like, why am I not doing this right? I'm not good enough. You know, why am I still doing compulsions? And, and, and again, it can be a lot more critical than that. I think, you know, if you think about having, you know, you're doing something challenging in life, like a sports event or, or, you know, you're playing a musical concert, whatever it is. And next to you, you have someone who is saying, you are awful. You've got no skills. You're not, you're going to fail. You can't do this. Look how weak you are. You know, are we going to play well in that sport? You know, are we going to do that challenging thing? Well, of course not. Mm -hmm. So, and, th and that can be a, a very critical voice. It can be more uh, just, you know, it could be just a, a voice that's trying to motivate you, but it's doing it in a sort of bullying type way, or it can be a feeling. And all of that adds stress into the system. And we we know that, you know, if anyone's had OCD, you know, stress interfaces with, with, the, with your experience of it, you know, at times of stress, you more often than not going to have a harder time with, with your intrusions and, and, you know, everything you're experiencing. Um, so I think it fuels it, it, it that way. I think that um, it fuels a relationship to our mind that's not helpful for OCD. So shame, you know, shame can make us take our minds very seriously, take our feelings very seriously. Compassion can make us sort of soften up and, and have more space and not take everything so seriously. And, you know, as we've talked about before, that sense, we've all got tricky brains. I'm not the only one. You know, that can really soften up and, and make it can facilitate diffusion in act terms, you know, the ability to watch the thoughts and step back. So I think compassion, you know, shame does the opposite of that. It fuses us more and it pushes us more into experiential avoidance and struggle with the emotion and, and compassion kind of softens it and gives us space and allows us to sort of trust ourselves more to move forward in our life. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. Good, good explanation. So let's actually before i move on are there any exercises are oh, there many exercises but any exercises you think worth sharing right now around self-compassion specifically yeah i mean in the context of this i would say building up a connection to your compassion itself so you could look at um you know on on the mindfulness circle youtube channel my youtube mm. channel there's quite a few compassion practices i've got a playlist so doing something that gets you in in touch with what uh, compassion focused therapy would call the compassion itself this part of us you know that is kind and and caring and wise and strong and courageous so building up a connection to that with imagery with words with various practices really that, that use the kind of imagery and, and, and words and posture and, and body to stimulate that compassion system. And then once you've built up a connection of it and you've worked through any barriers to that, you know, any fears, blocks, resistance mm -hmm. to that, then applying that to the present moment of, um, 
of shame with OCD and the past shame. So you work, you know, you'd pick a memory of you really struggling with OCD and then as your compassion itself, extend kind, supportive words or imagine giving yourself a hug or whatever it might be. Um, and the same with history. With And, you know, if you go back into the past, just softens it all up. You know, it's a, it's a practice you find across all kinds of different um, therapy schools, you know, everything from CFT, ACT, schema therapy, um, you know, all kinds of things will have this sort of working with the past and, you know, imagery rescripting and mm -hmm. this sort of stuff. So, and even in, you know, Tibetan practices and more traditional meditation, they've been doing it for, you know, hundreds of hundreds of years. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, going back and just extending it. And then the effect of that is more compassion in the present moment. So it's like you massage out that old wound, get that scar tissue moving, and then, it translates into more flexibility, more compassion in the present. Yeah. yeah, I like that. Yeah, of course, compassion's become popular in like the last 10 years, but of course it wasn't invented 10 years ago. It's, it's been around <laughs> for a long time. Yeah. I yeah. think we've just realized that it, it has some kind of, I don't want to say yeah. superpower, but some utility, and now we're starting to really use it more. But obviously, yeah. generations ago, it was all other generations and cultures realized that thousands of years yeah. ago. Yeah, yeah. It's true of all of them, right? Compassion, acceptance, values, being in the present moment. These are all ancient ideas um, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. So um, let's, and obviously I'll link to your YouTube channel. As you say, there's a lot of really good um, guided med uh, visualizations, exercises. I don't want to say, yeah, meditations on your channel. Uh, so, um, as we discussed before, it's, it's important to, to build up psychological flexibility, maybe before really ramping up with ERP. Um, I guess, one, what am I talking about? And two, why is this important? Yeah, this is something I feel passionate about. I guess the idea behind this is that we want to build psychological skills that support ERP before we dive into it. Mm -hmm. Um so what I mean by the psychological skills, I mean, I would hold a kind of act and a compassion view to this, but there might be other, you know, within other traditions, other modalities, there might be other skills as well. But the skills I would think about would be, you know, the, the, the three core areas of act being present, you know, being flexible and fluid with our attention in the present moment, uh, being open to our experience, so open to difficult thoughts and feelings, so not struggling not fighting with them, also not being pushed around into compulsions, being able to surf those urges, put them down, step back, observe our mind, not add the mental compulsions um, and, and, you know, not be pushed around basically by our emotions, be open and, and flexible with them and then doing what matters. So, you know, connecting to our values and sense of purpose and meaning and, and building behaviors and habits around that. So, you know, those three skills to get those in place you, you, at a baseline level and then start to apply that in ERP. And to juxtapose that, the opposite of that, which I see often with, with clients who've had, you know, great, you know, therapy in many ways and great ERP, but this part has just been missed. And, and I had this as well. I had quite a few rounds of ERP before I started to, you know, bring ACT skills into it and, and had a therapist that supported that. Um, and, and, you know, really the opposite of that would look like, okay, I'm doing ERP to get my symptoms down. That's what I really care about. Okay, I'm going to do this exposure. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I've done it. You know, and, and you know, it's just, it can be very close to white knuckling. There's no slowing down, diffusing, unhooking from your mind, flexible with your attention, openness, acceptance, values. There's none of that in it. Um, and it can work for people. And, and I think related to compassion, Deborah Lee in, 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 in Compassion Focus Therapy has this great metaphor, more in the context of, of trauma, but I think it's you know, I, I think it's relevant or at least looking at in the, the context of OCD, which is that people have train tracks of, of psychological skills. So, mm -hmm. you know, in trauma, there, there's a debate now, especially in PTSD, in complex PTSD of how quick you go to exposure work, you know, do you build up, 
resources and supports and skills and things like that before doing it or do you just go straight into it and the outcome research can show it can work very quickly and people can go into it and her metaphor here is that some people have train tracks laid down so the train tracks are the psychological skills they have distress tolerance they have attentional skills they have connection and relationship in, in their life they have a sense of self-esteem and self-belief to some degree and that might be innate you know they might just have been one of those kids who got a bash on the head and didn't wasn't even upset by that you'll know that yourself as you look at kids they all have different levels of sort of experiential avoidance as soon as they come out out of their mums really and um you know so that there's there's that kind of innate, but then there's also the learnt from the learning history that we talked about before. Have they had a secure base internalize that? And so if you don't have the train tracks laid down, you go straight into exposure. It could work, you know, it could start to develop those skills, but it also could derail you and there could be nothing to run on. And, you know, and so what I see in some of my clients is sometimes it works well because they have some level of those train tracks but in, in other clients, it actually has just pushed them into more compulsions or it's pushed, pushed them into depression or, or de- dissociation or just, you know, high dropout rates. You know, we know that, you know, 30 percent ERP dropout rates and, and you know, um, uh, the relapse rate is high and all that. So, you know, I, I, my, my sense here is that with the building the psych flex, the psych, psychological flexibility skills first, compassion skills then you have those train tracks down to then start doing the exposure work and some clients i mean you you know this yourself like they come into therapy and i was like this when i was struggling with ocd and it's it's all the time you know it's compulsions all day long and and then you you push someone into trying to do exposure in that place just more compulsions i say more mental compulsions pop up and it jumps around and and you know, and sometimes it numbs people out. So they get a kind of kind of uh, symptoms come down, but they're actually quite numbed out as well. So for me to lay those train tracks down with these skills and practice this a lot and get that so that you then work at levels of exposure where people can still access the skills and still have them online. And then you move through the hierarchy or even jump around the hierarchy. But when people are willing and they know their skills are, uh, are there in place, one last thing on that was my own experience. So, you know, I, I tried everything, like all kinds of stuff to help me with, with OCD and, and talk about shame. You know, I didn't tell anyone about my OCD for decades, you know, just out of shame. Um, and I tried everything, all kinds of stuff to try and help me with it. And then I had CBT and, and different rounds of ERP. And I, there was a real agenda in me of trying to get rid of symptoms mm-hmm. at that point. And, I, it didn't work for me that way of approaching it. And then my OCD had jumped around quite a bit. And it landed on, you know, real intense health anxiety, death anxiety, existential type themes, really intense, like, you know, panic attacks all day long. Anything I looked at could sort of trigger it. And, you know, it was really intense. And I, I went into therapy at that point. Just I just had a few sessions with, um, you know, my therapist at that point, but I went into it and I'd kind of rediscovered act. And I thought, there's no way I can sort of overcome this fear. You know, if I get a brain tumor tomorrow, I am not going to be able to be calm and and non-anxious with that. So, or, you know, like facing all those crazy existential fears and things like that, they're just difficult. So I thought what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to build acceptance skills in this exposure. So I'm going to do these horrendous exposure scripts of, of like, uh, you know, me dying and going through that process and, you know, real detail. And I'm going to work on being as comfortable as I can in that. Again, real acceptance and mindfulness and, uh, uh, you know, psychological flexibility. And that's why I feel so so passionate about it, because that was the thing that really helped me the most. And the clients I see you do best are the ones who who use who approach it as building skills and really work that um you know and 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 that's their main agenda not trying to control symptoms or get rid of them and then the side effect is they get better you know they get better in terms of symptoms not that that's not what they're targeting Mm. yeah thank thank you for sharing that using your own life to illustrate it uh like it reminded me of a i think it was a abe lincoln that said 
so it's something like if I have like five hours to cut down a tree, I'm going to spend four hours sharpening my axe. Yeah. Yeah. As exactly. opposed to you imagine that just going straight into ERP, it's just trying to cut that tree down with a blunt axe. It's going to be painful. Yeah. It's going to take it way longer. And yeah. And, yeah. and some people have naturally a sharp axe, you yeah, know, true. just the way they are. And, but, but a lot of people don't actually. Mm. Uh, I was thinking about it on a, on a walk today and I thought of the metaphor of mountain bike riding actually that, you know, it's like you go to the top of the mountain and someone goes, just go for it. And you've never been on a bike before. And some people have natural balance, natural cur- courage. I mean, it's not really courage because they're just not scared of it. But a courage is doing it when you're scared. But yeah. they, they, you know, they, they're naturally prone to adrenaline and competent and they're not too, mm-hmm. they don't think they're going to fall off and they go for it and they do well. And then other people try to do that because of the lack of, of those innate capacities fall off immediately. And then other people probably like myself would have done, have the brakes on yeah. going down this mountain at a snail's pace. And then they're falling off because of that. So, mm-hmm. you know, really actually let's get the bike out and ride it on the flat first. And then let's go up a little hill and then let's, you know, then let's learn to bunny hop and then let's do little by little more and more. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, spot on. So I think the question that comes to my mind is, um, okay, so you're working on psychological flexibility skills or skills that uh, promote that. At what point do you start to bring in a hierarchy and actual exposures and in terms of sessions, I think I'm asking. In terms of sessions, yeah. I mean, I I, I really like the values-based exposure approach from ACT and, you know, very – um, inspired by a uh, friend of the podcast, Patricia Zarita Owner, and her sort of approach to values based exposure. And anyone interested, obviously, you can check that out in, in her book. And yeah. um, so, but I would do it fairly early, start to, to build up um, a potential values based hierarchy. So, you know, pretty early, I would be, you know, I'd obviously, like everyone, be doing assessment and, and looking at formulation, looking at the, the presentation of OCD, the obsessions, the compulsions, you know, other parts of the life as well. Other, you know, other things in the history, like we said, compassion, mm-hmm. markers for compassion, other things as well, but probably session, maybe two, three, four, even, you know, it depends on the person I've had lots of clients who've had lots of therapy before had lots of ERP before so we can almost take the you know the yeah. hierarchy and adjust it make it a bit more values based and think about what it's in service of um but pretty early on alongside developing the skills okay. and actually one of the first things on the values based exposure hierarchy might be just practicing skills cuz you know for me with OCD uh, doing meditation you know decades ago it was there all the time you know that was exposure mm-hmm. itself as soon as i sat in stillness my mind would just be ping 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 in intrusive thoughts and you know just going going berserk um and and so even just to start to do the skills together you know in the relationships it's different we have that that sense of hopefully compassion and security and and you know that's a way that we 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 learn the psychological flexibility skills is in the relationship as well um but just that might be the first thing on the hierarchy. And then we might be moving to imaginary stuff or mental rehearsal. And then we might be moving to, um, you know, actually putting down compulsions or facing, you know, fears or starting to watch things or read things or use certain triggers and, and, and everything else. Um, so yeah, pretty early on we'd start and build it up over time as, and, and really it would relate to goals as well, right? It would relate to, their goals for therapy and what they want to see as a change here. Um, you know, I would build that into the the hierarchy quite a bit and values, you know, looking as we're exploring values early on as motivation um, to do the exposure work, you know, that would bring up things that we could start putting on that hierarchy as well. Yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense. And you're still, uh, even as you're like well into doing ERP, you're still coming back to those those tools, those skills that you've taught around psychological flexibility and compassion? Yeah, I practice every session. I mean, often with most of my clients, unless there's something immediate that's happened or something we need to tackle right away, I'll, I'll do practice at the start of every session pretty much. Yeah. Because I just think to have at least got that in, you know, at least done some practice. Mm. Um, and that could be as simple as dropping anchor 
or another mindfulness practice, or it might be doing a, a short exposure practice, you know, and a skills based exposure practice to start or a compassion practice as well. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Interesting. And do you use dropping anchor? So anyone that doesn't know what we're talking about, if you listen to the Russ Harris, most recent Russ Harris episode, he, he guides us through dropping anchor in that. But um, Johnny, do you use dropping anchor while doing exposures? Like if they start to get too overwhelmed? Or- yes, yes, definitely. I mean, I, I it would be more, I mean, Russ talks about dropping anchor as more of a philosophy, a way of introducing the all, the whole psychological flexibility skills you know so you have um present moment attention you have openness you have uh you know doing what matters within it but uh it would vary with people in the beginning i would do every part so acknowledge thoughts and feelings come back to the body engage in the world around you and what you're doing later on it might we might not use the body so much because actually people are pretty good at observing and and refocusing but i would be as i do an exposure with someone Every, you know, every few minutes we're going to be running through, you know, acknowledging the thoughts and feelings, coming back to the present moment, using our, our attention in different ways. Um, we might come back to values throughout the exposure, especially at difficult parts. You know, if someone's on the threshold and courageously facing their fears, we might go back to what's this about? You know, why are you doing this? What matters? Really bringing that in or workability. We might go just remember what happens like. OCD is telling you now that it will keep you safe, but look at your experience. It is taking your life away. So let's take this step forward and do one more thing together. So it would be flowing between those, those different, you know, different skills, but yeah, a lot of dropping anchor and the body in dropping anchor when someone's in panic or they're freezing, they're dissociating and then getting the body back is, is kind of essential. I think so often we'll use that when needed. Um, And then, you know, as people go on, it might be, more engaged they don't actually need to do such a a a long drop in anchor because they're just good at you know unhooking from thoughts putting down compulsions surfing the urge to do mental or physical compulsions and engaging in 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 what matters during an exposure so in that case you know it might not be so in depth it's more just checking in and i'll do it interpersonally so people are feeding back and getting a sense of what's going on and then that will give cues for if we need to do one skill more or what someone's getting stuck with or you know it helps you you understand their experience and i might even do the dipping in and out the stream so in the middle of the exposure get them to get a compulsion going a compulsion loop going and then practice stepping back unhooking putting it down and then dipping in and out you know like russ um is a big fan of dipping in, in and out of the stream. I think it's really helpful with the, the mental compulsions. So yeah, if anyone's interested in more, it's it, on my YouTube channel. I've got two values based exposure uh, guided practices that cover a lot of these skills. You know, as, as so you get a flavor of it in that. Yeah, excellent. No, that's awesome. So um, let's talk about. We, I mean, you've already kind of been alluding to it and shared some stuff, but particularly just a compassionate approach to ERP. Um, yeah, so just 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 taking that heading, um, what is like the compassionate approach to ERP? Yeah, I think it's so crucial. Again, you know, related back to shame, my own experience, how hard I was on myself, how critical I was about, you know, thinking I was fearful and anxious because of this stuff, you know, developing compassion really helped me with my own mental health, you know, not just those to the other aspects as well. So I'm sort of passionate about it because of that. Um, and it, and it's needed because, you know, we've got great therapy out there. We've got really good ERP therapy and therapists and, and, you know, really skilled stuff going on, but we don't help as many people as we want to. So you know, to have some other options, some other tools is, is sort of crucial. So for me, the compassionate approach to ERP is, you know, tapping into our compassionate motivation to begin with. So that's kind of a values connection to compassion, thinking about what does self-compassion mean to me? Why am I doing this? You know, recognizing my suffering, responding, you know, to try and help and support me through it. What's that all about? Both self-compassion but compassion flowing out as well you know cft is hugely about balancing those different flows of of compassion so getting that as a motivation and a support to engage in erp 
um, you know, developing this compassionate self, this part of us, um, you know, and using that when it's tough, when it's hard to do ERP, when it's hard to move out into your life and, and pursue your values, when, you know, you're feeling anxious or overwhelmed by difficult feelings, shame. So, you know, compassion is is really in CFT is about courage. Strength and courage is a huge part of it. And courage, you know, to me, um, you know, thinking about the mountain bike example, well, you know, if, if someone launches themselves off the mountain and they're not really that scared, they're kind of excited and part of them believes they're going to be fine, they'll get through and they can handle it, then that's not really courage. Courage is our clients pushing into fear when part of their brain is literally thinking they or someone else is going to die or they're going to make everyone miserable or they're going to have this unbearable feeling for the rest of their life or, or whatever the, the core fear might be. You know, that's courageous and compassion supports courage, you know, so, so, you know, setting that up at the beginning, um, certain clients doing more of it when there's a lot of harsh inner critic trauma, you know, if, if anyone has a trauma history, I'm going to do a lot more compassion there as well. And, and getting that as a, another sort of psychological base to then start doing, doing the exposure. And again, it might be a skill we're using the exposure. So, and it, you know, if, if someone's in a tough place, actually doing a brief compassion practice of, of mindfully noticing the experience and then saying something supportive and compassionate and motivating and, and helping us. Um, so, you know, really using those skills throughout and also a compassionate approach to taking care of ourselves as we do the hard work of, of exposure and therapy, because actually we know, you know, we need rest to recover and learn, you know, our neuro neuroscientist friends are telling us you need plenty of that to consolidate new learning and things. So of course that can be difficult if you've got OCD 24 seven, it's mm -hmm. very hard to rest, but, you know, to have some attempt of soothing and calming and grounding and, with supportive, safe others in, in, in doing activities that are compassionate to balance out those intense periods of pushing into it and, and working on it. Um, so compassionate action being a, a huge part, compassionate attention, what we focus on. So that would be some ideas. I, I, I do really like um, Kimberly Quinlan's new book on this is great. There's obviously a lot of CFT and lots of good ideas in that. And, and, um, uh, John Hirschfield and, and, and Charlotte Nicely's Everyday Mindfulness has a really nice bit on compassion in that. It tells you how to avoid the pitfall of making it a sort of reassurance compulsion and, you know, in, in it, how to how to kind of spot that and use it to help you, motivate you, keep you going. Um, so, yeah, that would be some thoughts. There's obviously a lot you could say on it, but mm -hmm. uh, also working on the history as well, you know, not just doing the ERP, but also working on the, the person's history. And so often I found, and that's something that my CFT supervisor, Chris Irons, really emphasizes is, is sometimes if someone's getting stuck on the, the, some of the ERP stuff, there's some shame, some difficult stuff in the past that if we extend compassion to that, it might soften it all up and make it more, uh, you know, more able to work with. Yeah. Yeah. Great answer. Um, and obviously, uh, compassion works massively for the inner critic that we all have to varying degrees. And I guess what came to my mind was around thinking of the inner critic while doing ERP. It's like, yeah, I didn't, I didn't do it well enough, or you know, I was meant to be with this thing for thirty minutes and I could only manage five, and I'm an idiot because of it, and whatever the inner critic's yeah. gonna say. And um, I guess I say the the inner critic, separate to OCD, will find something to pull you up on if you if you allow it. And yeah. maybe talking a bit about that and the compassion for that. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. A huge, huge part that comes up all the time. Um, and I think that, you know, one principle for me is recycle the reaction. So as we're doing exposure work and, you know, we're unhooking from the difficult obsessions and, and surfing the urge to do the compulsions. And then sometimes the mind will do sneaky things like it'll go into the inner critic and a more 
depressed voice or a different feeling will come up or something else. And it's really trying to get us into, you know, a different type of, of cognitive process, like, mm. you know, resentment or, or self-attack or judgment, like you're saying, or self-blame. So really treating that as another thing to diffuse and unhook and, and then extend compassion and supportive voice that actually no one makes big changes immediately. No one does difficult things in all in one go. We slip and recommit. We try again. So the compassionate voice, the function of it is to, to motivate us and keep us going. And I like, you can, you know, in CFT, sometimes there's dialogue between the, the critic and the compassion itself. I like, especially in OCD, actually, it's more like they're alongside each other. So, you know, the compassionate voice is just there with you, supporting you, and you're actually diffusing from the critic. So you're observing and noticing and naming or just observing and, and noticing the critic stepping back. And then compassion is alongside you like a supportive voice on a, you know, you're running a marathon and you get near the end and it's this voice in your head that says, you're nearly there. Just keep mm -hmm. going. Remember why you're doing this, what it's in service of. And, you know, there's another voice and you're going, you're knackered, give up, yeah. you know, it's too hard. So you, you don't argue with that because it is knackering and hard and difficult. You step back, diffuse, mm -hmm. and then you use a supportive voice to, to keep you going. Um, so, yeah, and I think in a, in a critic can do some funny things. It can blend with OCD. I've had that in some clients where it's more like it becomes you know, judgment statements or commands, or it's like the inner critic and, and OCD have kind of merged a little bit. So, mm -hmm. you know, just being ready for any, anything your mind does and not get it into categories too much, just workability. Is this thought helpful or not? You know, and should I diffuse step back and, and, and engage in my life? So, yeah, I, I think it'll help a lot with within a critic because, again, imagine you're doing exposure therapy and you've got someone next to you going, you're not doing enough. What are you doing? You know, you're a, you're a loser. You can't do this. Like, it's going to be tough to do that exposure therapy with that voice there. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, and the other thing that comes to my mind is sometimes with the, the inner critic, people think, well, if I let that go, then I won't have any drive or motivation because it's the critic that's moving me forward, you know, and yeah. professional athletes hold on to this. Sometimes it's, it's that critic that's yeah. got me to be elite, you know, yeah. but it's like, you think of uh, Jurgen Klopp for Liverpool. He's very, he seems very compassionate to his players. He seems like he's created a great culture, but yet he still holds them accountable. If they slip up, he's going to be on their case, but he's going to be doing it in a supportive, nurturing way. At least I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas traditionally other managers may have been more like, why have you messed up screaming at their players? I've had coaches like this for basketball before. It's just left me depleted, me hating on the manager and not want to play at all well. Yeah. So it's like you can still hold yourself accountable, but you can do it in a nurturing way. Yeah. 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 And a fierce and a courageous and a wise way. You know, um, if, if you're looking after a kid and they ask for endless ice cream, it, you know, it's not compassionate to keep giving them ice cream. We've got to have, you know, a boundary and, and, you know, and have some limits, at least, at least try to ace right, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but um, you, you're right. I think, you know, this is a common um, fear around compassion that I'll lose my edge or, you know, let myself off the hook. But is that really kind, you know, to let yourself off the hook on your goals? It's not kind to do that compassionate. So you're right. I think the voice can be motivating and it can it can be quite courageous. The problem is that sometimes people, are, like you're saying, with athletes, very successful and they use that harsh inner critic. And sometimes they use more of a motivational voice and it can be a bit of both they're using. And then they, they you know, with intermittent conditioning, it only needs to work once to make us feel like it's the thing that helps. So we only need one time when we're exhausted and you went, you idiot, get on with it. And it worked. And then you think, God, that's what I need. But yeah. excuse me, I, often I think it's correlation, not causation, actually. And, you know, it's more the, the motivator is more values. You know, if you look at public health programs, it's not, you know, the voice, it's not the message on the cigarette box saying you're going to get cancer and this is what it looks like mm -hmm. that changes. It's actually, I want to be healthy and well for my kids. I want to be able to play sports. You know, I, I want to feel, you know, uh, well when I'm later in my life you know that kind of values-based thing will motivate people to change more so you know yes maybe the inner critic at times helps you do stuff 
But a lot of the time it doesn't. It makes you feel worse. And, you know, just look at your experience closely with mindfulness and you'll see that. You know, that's one of the things compassion often starts with mindfulness first and then moving towards compassion because, you know, we have to be able to see our suffering to really then be compassionate. And sometimes we're not seeing our suffering. But I've, yeah, I've had a lot of clients, high achieving clients, you know, re- real, you know, uh, you know, athletes and things like that. And, you know, it's exactly as you say, there's a kind of negotiation going on between us of like, well, let's at least try a compassionate voice. And maybe it does need to be a little bit more motivating and, and and kind of courageous, but let's give it a shot and see how it works for you and then trust your experience. So the same in ERP, let's try having a compassionate voice to get you to go to do it, you know, maybe using it at times of difficulty and let's see how it works and then trust your experience. And you can always go back to being very critical <laughs> to yourself. You know, yeah, that, that yeah, voice yeah. won't go for long if you want to get stuck in there. Yeah, good point. What have you got to lose? Give it a try, right? um okay so i guess lastly on any of this we've discussed is there anything else you wanted to add i think we've obviously covered a lot of ground i think that um you know in some ways it is that that workability of trying you know these skills out and 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 trying them and trying these approaches and then trusting your your experience and and you know particularly i guess one thing with the psychological flexibility skills is probably particularly with the mental compulsions that can be so slippery, so automatic, so unconscious, almost going on for me when it was bad going on all day long and you barely even knew, you know, you just on all, you can, you can have that chatter going on and still work or still do stuff. And, um, you know, and, and when it's like that, to have some ability to watch your mind and do diffusion and practice that skill you know, I couldn't imagine how I could have put down mental compulsions without practicing that skill to be aware because they're just there all the time. And if I put them down, they'll just leap up on something else or it'll move from OCD to, you know, we know the default mode network in the brain will often go towards self-referential, self-critical, you know, difficult material. And that's true of everyone. You know, there's this research of, you know, large portions of the time, most people's minds wander onto that sort of stuff. So without some ability to kind of observe that and watch that and use that skill is very difficult so you have this phenomenon you put down physical compulsions then you just get a load more of that that mental stuff going on or you you put down one aspect of the mental stuff and then it jumps around and does stuff so it's so slippery and and automatic that i think to train that skill because most people like with me when i began mindfulness like i couldn't focus for more than 20 seconds if that you know i remember my early mindfulness practice and i was gone for the whole time and you know a lot of the time it was in ocd at that point actually i was i was off doing compulsion so you know to be able to just put them down it's tough without training i think for most people otherwise everyone would be great at meditation if it was that easy you'd sit and you'd just do mindfulness of breathing and it would be you know easy because you, you'd want to do it so th- I, I think that part's really sneaky i think urges you know urges to do physical compulsions are really tough to resist without some skill of urge surfing and observing that feeling and diffusing from the thoughts of the feeling and you know the uh, making room for the uncomfortable feeling so without those skills i think it's really tough um so that would be the only thing i'd want to underline that uh, that we maybe didn't cover so much was just you know training that skill it will make erp much easier yeah yeah nice thank you for adding that um so obviously it's your birthday tomorrow yeah um don't remind me yeah I mean, <laughs> no, i'm very happy I, well i'm 39 i'll tell you oh, nice. no shame no shame here so it is a big number <laughs> so on that then so you pick up the phone and call the 30 year old johnny mm. what do you tell him keep going and just keep doing everything you, you you're getting into and you're building you know, and keep being kind. I, it would be a compassionate message. I think always, and I, I give that message to my younger self a lot when I do these practices with clients or for myself, it's, you know, just really underscoring to be kind and supportive just makes everything easier. Absolutely. So lastly, anything else you wish you could have said or you want to add or? 
Um, real pleasure to talk to you as always. And I, I guess, yeah, I would direct anyone to the Mindfulness Circle YouTube channel and also um, Patricia Zurita Ono and I are doing this monthly Let's Chat Act talk. And you can find that on her social media or her website, the, the link to that. So, you know, it's a free once a month chat on ACT and all skills, um, you know, particularly OCD focused. So that might be something that people are interested in. Nice. Um, but yeah, really good to connect again and, and great to see you. Yeah, as I'll always. Put, put all the links in the show notes for all the stuff you mentioned um but yeah great to chat and especially on this topic compassion is something that we all need and uh may it could be the missing ingredient for some people that are struggling with erp so yeah, yeah. definitely i think it, i think it often is yeah Thank you for listening to this week's podcast. If you enjoy the OCD Stories podcast and would like to support us with a one-time tip slash donation, please go to theocdstories.com forward slash support. All tips, no matter how large or small, are greatly appreciated. Please subscribe and rate the show wherever you listen to the podcast. And thank you to NoCD for supporting our work. If you want to find out more about NoCD, head to go.treatmyocd.com forward slash the OCD stories or click the link in the episode description. And quick disclaimer, guys, this podcast is not therapy. It is not a replacement for therapy. Please seek treatment from a trained professional. And until we speak, take care.